Hello, friends, and welcome again to Understanding Daniel, a verse-by-verse study in this amazing prophetic book. I want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world, part of our extended Sabbath school class. We also want to welcome those who are here in person. You've come faithfully week after week. You've been here as we studied verse by verse through the book of Daniel. Today we're at the last chapter, chapter 12 of Daniel. There's 13 verses in this chapter, but they power-packed verses. So there's a lot of information we want to try and cover this morning. So we're going to get right to it. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we are so grateful for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to study together. And this is a very important passage, Lord, that ties everything together that we've studied thus far in the book of Daniel. So we do pray for the Holy Spirit to come and guide us. This is your book, the whole Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we ask the Holy Spirit now to guide us. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Daniel chapter 12. And we'll start in verse 1. We'll get right to it. Daniel 12. Beginning in verse 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone that is found written in the book. So here is a power-packed verse. There's a number of important themes That's highlighted. First of all, the first thing I want to mention about chapter uh, 12, verse 1, is this is talking about a time period yet in the future. It says when Michael stands up. As we study, we'll realize that has not happened yet. It's talking about a future event. But first of all, who is Michael? Well, if you look at the notes, the name Michael literally means who is like God. That's the meaning of the name. And it is given to Jesus in the prophetic books of Daniel, Jude, and Revelation. Doing a little comparison between different Bible verses, it makes it very clear that Michael is the prophetic name of Christ. For example, we just read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Michael stands up. He's the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Jesus is the great prince who stands for the people of God. The second verse is Jude 1, verse 9. It says, yet Michael, the archangel. So here it's referring to Michael as the archangel. We're not saying that the archangel is an angelic being. The word arch means ruler of, or the one above, just like an arch is over something. So Michael is the ruler of the angels, all right? So here we have Michael the archangel in contending with the devil. Now, archangel means ruler over the angels. Jesus is the ruler of the angels. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself... Who? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel. Notice the Lord himself and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus is described as having the voice of the archangel. And then in John chapter 5 verse 28, all that are in their graves shall hear his voice, that is the voice of Jesus, and shall come forth. It is the voice of Jesus that will raise the dead, thus Michael is Jesus. Does that make sense? So again, we're not saying that Jesus is a created being. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were made by Him. He is God, He was God, He still will ever be God. But in His role as being the leader of the angels, He's referred to as Michael. Sometimes in the Old Testament, Jesus is also referred to as the angel of the Lord. Now, the word angel means messenger. Christ would sometimes come in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, as the messenger from the Lord. So that's what we mean when we're talking about Michael. So we're talking about an event yet in the future when Jesus stands up. Michael, or Jesus, will stand up at the end of the investigative judgment at the close of human probation. You're going to read about that in Daniel 7. When Jesus ceases his intercession in in the heavenly sanctuary, the destiny of every person would have been decided for life or for death. At that time, the inhabitants of the earth will be divided into two groups, those who have the seal of God, Revelation 7, and those who have the mark of the beast. So let's talk briefly about the close of human probation and the investigative judgment. Daniel chapter 7, just going to take you back a few chapters. You remember Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a dream or a vision, 
And in the vision, he sees different beasts coming up out of the sea. The first is like a lion, representing Babylon. The second was like a bear, representing Medo-Persia. The third was like a leopard with four heads, representing the Grecian kingdom or Grecian empire, Alexander's kingdom. And then the fourth is a dragon-like beast. And what's interesting about this fourth beast is that it has ten horns. You remember this? And then he notices that a little horn arose and uprooted three other horns. We're going to talk about that later in today's study. Then the little horn persecuted the people of God for 1,260 years. Now we understand that to be the papal power, and we already studied all of this. After you have the little horn power arise and rule for 1,260 years, which ended in 1798, then you have this passage in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. So the events that I'm going to read to you took place after 1798, after the reign of the little horn power. Here's what it says, Daniel 7, beginning verse 9. It's not in the notes, but you have your Bibles. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place. This is Daniel in vision. And the Ancient of Days was seated. That's God the Father. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. So after the little horn power ruled for 1260 years, ending in 1798, the next thing brought to view is a judgment occurring in heaven. It talks about the ancient of days who is seated and the books are opened. But then we read in verse 13, same chapter, Daniel 7 verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, behold, one like unto the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven, that's the angels. He came to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father. They brought him near before him. Then to him, to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. So sometime after the little horn power is ruled for 1260 years, which came to an end in 1798, there is this heavenly judgment that takes place. Well, if you compare Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, it actually tells you the time when this judgment would begin, and we'll get to that later, that's in 1844. But at the end of this pre-advent judgment, then it is that Jesus stands up. And when Jesus stands up, then probation closes. Now, what is happening before Jesus stands up? Well, we're in this judgment hour. But part of this judgment is a work of sealing, a sealing for the righteous and a marking for the wicked. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 describes four angels holding back the four winds of strife. This is Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. We're living at that time right now. It's because of God's mercy that we still have relative calm, although it seems as though things are gathering, momentum is gathering, the world is beginning to fall apart around us, but yet the angels are still holding in check those winds of strife. But at some point, if you're reading Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, those angels are going to let go. But before they let go, Revelation 7, verse 2, then I saw an angel ascending from the east or coming from the east. The east is the direction of deliverance. It symbolizes heaven, the dwelling place of God. So an angel is seen flying from heaven. So an angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. That's happening now. We are living in a sealing time, a settling into the truth that we cannot be moved. The sealing is the character of God. You read late in Revelation, it's the name of God in the forehead. A name represents character. Jesus is doing a work in this cleansing work in heaven. There is a corresponding cleansing on earth, a cleansing amongst his people, a settling into the truth, a trusting in Jesus, preparatory to a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We call that the latter rain. So the latter rain has not yet come in its fullness. We don't know when it will come. The Bible doesn't tell us. 
But just before probation closes, there is a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Those who now are seeking for the character of God in their foreheads, in their hearts, in their minds, they are the ones who receive the latter rain. So we're in the sealing time right now. But at the same time, while there's a sealing that's beginning to take place amongst God's people, there is also a marking that is going to take place amongst the wicked. Because we read in Revelation chapter 13, it says he caused all, this is verse 16, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the forehead, that no one might buy or sell except he who has the mark and the name of the beast, the number of his name. So there's a sealing for God's people. There is a marking for the wicked. And once this work of sealing and marking is complete and the latter rain comes, then Jesus stands up, probation closes, and the Holy Spirit that has been holding in check the powers of the wicked, the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn and another spirit will come upon the world. Remember the parable that Jesus told? He said if... Uh, an evil spirit, he's cast out of a man, and he wanders around empty places, and then he comes back to the man, and if the man's heart is not filled with a good spirit, he goes and he gets other spirits worse than he, and they move in. And uh, the second condition is worse than the first. So when people reject the Holy Spirit, there comes a point where the Holy Spirit is withdrawn, and the spirit of Satan takes possession. And he's going to take possession of the world, except for those who have the seal of God in their foreheads. So that's kind of the time that we find ourselves. That's what's described here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. All right, moving on. At the end of the 70 weeks, or the 490 years, which we read about in chapter 9, at the end of the 490 years of probationary time that was given to the Jewish nation, Stephen, if you remember, saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, this was during the trial of Stephen. Stephen stood before the same council that just three and a half years earlier had condemned Jesus to death. And while Stephen is giving testimony of the truth, he looks up and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Well, when was Stephen stoned? The date for that was 34 AD. The standing of Jesus at the stoning of Stephen marked the end of probationary time for the Jewish nation as a whole. Now, in Daniel chapter 12, once again, there is a standing of Jesus, marking the end of probation, not just for a nation, but now for the whole world, because then a time of trouble comes, as we'll see. The standing of Jesus, as seen by Stephen, this is the middle of the paragraph, marked the end of probationary time for the Jewish nation. Likewise, at the time of the end, when Michael stands up, it'll mark the end of probation for all the nations of the earth. Revelation chapter 11, 18 describes this time. It says, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. That is the outpouring of the seven last plagues, still in the future. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you will reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. That's the second coming of Christ. Those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. That happens at the second coming of Christ. So when probation closes, it says, the nations are angry. Well, of course, that'll happen even to a greater degree than we have seen in the last 150 years. At the closing of the door on Noah's Ark, uh, that sealed the destiny of the antediluvian world. So the ending of Christ's high priestly ministry in heaven will close the door on all human probation. Jesus will then end his priestly ministry and begin his kingly ministry as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will execute judgment upon the wicked and the outpouring of the seven last plagues and deliver the righteous at his second coming. Now, there are three phases to Christ's ministry in the plan of redemption. And at each of these three phrases, or phases, I should say, the words, it is finished or it is done, is heard. The first phase of Christ's ministry was when he came to the earth to bear our sins and to die as the Lamb of God to die as our sacrifice, and when Jesus was hanging on the cross just before he died, he said, it is finished. That first phase of Christ's ministry was complete. But Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And now he is our high priest ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary. 
we find, looking at Bible prophecy, that Jesus is in that final phase of his high priestly ministry, in the work of the judgment, the pre-advent judgment, where Christ, still a high priest, is interceding on our behalf. But once that work is finished and probation closes, again the words are heard in heaven, it is done. Christ's priestly phase is now finished. Christ removes his priestly robe, he puts on his kingly robe, now he's going to come back as king of kings and lord of lords. It's too late at that point to beg for forgiveness. Matter of fact, the wicked turn to the rocks and the mountains when they see Jesus coming and they say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of judgment has come. The great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? So it's too late once probation closes. But he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. And then once at the very end, after sin and sinners are destroyed, the earth is recreated. Once again, the words are heard, it is done. Now spoken by God the Father. It's the end of sin. All things are made new. So three phases in the ministry and the work of Jesus. Okay, Revelation 22, that's what we spoke about. Still talking about this time of trouble in verse 1. There's a lot in verse 1. The time of trouble refers to in this verse is the great time of trouble that will immediately following the close of probation. During this time, the seven last plagues will be poured out upon the wicked, and the world will be in a state of turmoil and distress never before seen. The Bible describes it as worse since there was a nation upon the earth. Now, what's going to happen to the righteous during this terrible time of trouble? Will they be raptured to heaven before the time of trouble, or will they be on the earth during the time of trouble? Were the children of Israel in Egypt when the ten plagues fell upon the land? Or were they taken out of Egypt before the plagues came? They were in Egypt. Now the first three of the ten plagues fell both upon the Egyptians and the Israelites to test their faith. But the last seven of the plagues that fell upon Egypt fell just upon the Egyptians. The Israelites were protected. And when we read in Revelation, we talk about these plagues falling upon the world, we call them the seven last plagues, meaning they fall just upon the wicked. God will protect his people during this time. For example, you have in Psalm 91, just a wonderful psalm. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Hopefully you can read it sometime on your own. But it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowl and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, that's war, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, that's disease, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday, that's natural disasters. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. So when the reward of the wicked is poured out, meaning the seven last plagues, God is going to take care of his people. Amen? Your bread and your water will be sure is what the Bible promises us. It won't be a walk in the park, but God will be with us. He'll sustain us. He'll provide for us, and he will see us through. Okay. Still in verse 1, the phrase, everyone who is now not found written in the book, is a reference to the investigative judgment that takes place in heaven prior to the close of probation. Uh, let me say that again. Everyone who is found written in the book. It's talking about the righteous here. And you can read about it in Revelation chapter 11. In addition to the books of record in heaven, another book called the Book of Life contains the name of all of those who have professed faith in God. In the judgment, those who have had only a form of godliness but not the fruits of righteousness, will have their names blotted out of the book of life. How do you get your name in the book of life? You accept Jesus as your personal Savior. You surrender your life to Him. But if it's a mere profession and not a genuine faith in the judgment, it'll be made known and your name gets removed from the book of life. Friends, I think that's happening even now. There are those whose names have been written in the book of life. There are those whose names have been removed from the book of life. That's happening now, the investigative judgment, based upon the choices they are making, based upon their faith and obedience to God. You read about that also in Exodus 32. Verse 2, 
It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now when it says sleep in the dust of the earth, it's referring to the dead. Some to everlasting life, that's the righteous. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's two groups that's been referred to. The righteous and the wicked. The phrase, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, is a reference to the resurrection which takes place at the second coming of Christ. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected, and together with the righteous living, they'll be glorified and taken to heaven. Of course, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about this in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice there's two resurrections. The first resurrection and the second. Revelation chapter 20 talks about two resurrections. The first resurrection is for the righteous. You want to be a part of that resurrection. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The wicked who are alive on the earth at the second coming of Christ will be destroyed with the brightness of his glory. The earth will be rendered completely uninhabitable and be left in a state of desolation. This is important to note. When Jesus comes the second time and takes his people, raptures the saints, so to speak, to heaven with him, the earth does not continue as normal. Life does not continue on earth for another seven years. No. If you read what the Bible says, it says the earth is broken down by the glory and the fire of the second coming of Christ. Just look at a few of these verses. Second, Thel- second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to, to give to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you going to be destroyed? These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burnt up. Does that sound like life as normal after the second coming? Jeremiah 25. Look at this verse. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus. He will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against the inhabitants of the earth. A noise will come from the ends to the ends of the earth. For the Lord is a controversy with the nations. He shall plead his case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. And there's other verses, but I think these will kind of paint the picture for us. So Jesus comes, the wicked are destroyed with the brightness of his coming, the righteous are taken to heaven. But what about the phrase in verse 2, some to shame and everlasting contempt? This refers to what we call a special resurrection of some of the wicked, not all the wicked. During the trial of Christ, In response to the high priest's question, Jesus told those condemning him that they would see him in glory coming in the clouds of heaven. Let me pause right there. It's a very interesting story you can read about in the gospel account where Jesus is standing before Caiaphas, the high priest. And all kinds of witnesses are trying to accuse him, but the witnesses couldn't agree amongst themselves. There was confusion. And Caiaphas became very angry. And Jesus didn't say a word. And finally, Caiaphas, looking straight at Jesus, said, I adjure thee by the Most High. Are you the Christ? And when he said that, Jesus could remain silent no longer. And Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am the Christ and you want evidence, you will have evidence. Hereafter, you will see me coming as a king. King of kings and Lord of lords coming in the clouds of glory. It would have been better for Caiaphas to have kept quiet and accepted the evidence that was so abundant because of the miracles and the words of Jesus. But no, he wanted additional proof. Jesus said, all right, you will receive it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of 
power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So Caiaphas and those leading his trial and his crucifixion will be raised up in response to their question. They will see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. And of course, we find this also in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, talking about the second coming. Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Talking about those who played a leading role in the crucifixion of Christ. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, what happens to them? Well, they are resurrected to see Jesus coming because they ask for proof, but they are destroyed with the rest of the wicked. And then they are resurrected at the end of the thousand years for the great white throne judgment when all the other wicked stand before God for the final judgment in Revelation chapter 11. All right, verse 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. The phrase like stars forever and ever is a reference to the wise who are the ones who proclaim the good news of salvation to others. The day is coming when those who try to save their lives will end up losing them, and those who are brave enough to risk everything for the truth in Christ will be richly rewarded with eternal life. They will shine bright forever like stars. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has a ear, let him hear. Verse 4. But to you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Now, what book are we talking about? The book of Daniel. But to you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, until when? Until the time of the end. Are we living in the time of the end today? We're going to see how that prophecy tells us that we are living in the time of the end, just a few moments. So the book of Daniel was to be sealed up, not fully understood, until a certain period of time. Many, it says, will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Knowledge of the prophecies will be increased, but also knowledge in general will be increased. We'll look at that. So the prophecies of Daniel present a succession of events leading down to the investigative investigative judgment, the close of probation, the time of trouble, and the second coming of Jesus. But part of the prophecy that related to the investigative judgment, Daniel was instructed to close up and seal until the time of the end. Not until the time of the end could the message of the judgment be proclaimed as it was based upon the fulfillment of a time prophecy. Now, I've mentioned this before, but in Scripture, we have something called present truth. Now, all of Scripture is truth, but there are moments where a special truth was proclaimed. And the reason it was a present truth was because it was connected with the fulfillment of a prophecy. For example, in the days before the flood, Noah preached about a coming flood He built the ark 120 years, and he preached a present truth message, come into the ark. Now, that was a true message, but that's not our message today, right? We don't have an ark, a literal ark, like Noah did. We're not proclaiming a literal flood, but we do have a present truth message about a judgment and the second coming of Christ. Now, where do we find this time-sensitive present truth message in Revelation? Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. We know it, the first angel's message. And I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Why does it have to go to the whole world? Because the second coming affects the whole world. Saying with a loud voice, what does he say? Fear God, give glory to him, and here's the present truth, for the hour of his judgment has come. There's a time element there. So the hour of his judgment didn't come in 34 A.D., The hour of his judgment begins just before the close of probation. So it's the announcement of that final work of Jesus. The hour of his judgment has come, as we see in Daniel chapter 7. Okay? Daniel is the only book in the Bible that was sealed until the time of the end, indicating that it would be unsealed or studied or understood at the appointed time. Well, the time of the end began in 1798. 
at the end of the 1,260 years of papal supremacy. You might say, well, Pastor Ross, how can you say the time of the end began in 1798? Well, I don't say it. The Bible does. Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 33. makes it so clear. And those of you people who understand shall instruct many, meaning the good people, the wise, the true-hearted, the faithful, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. It's talking about a time of persecution during the Dark Ages. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. This is talking about the Reformation now. The Reformation started good, the 1500s, but as it became popular, there were many that came into the Reformed churches and went to those nations that proclaimed the Reformation, but they came in for the wrong reason. They diluted the church. Many will join by them by intrigue, it says, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, to purify them, to make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for an appointed time. So there it's talking about a time of persecution that would come upon the true followers of Christ. It would come upon the Protestants until the time of the end. Well, what ended the persecution that came upon the Protestants? 1798, the political power of the papacy was removed. That brought an end to the 1260 years. So 1798 marks the beginning of the time of the end. That's when the book of Daniel would begin to be unsealed. All right? People would be able to study it and understand it and understand the time significance connected with the book. In the years following 1798, just look at this. The study of Bible prophecy led to a great awakening in Protestant countries around the world. Numerous Bible societies were formed, including the British and the Foreign Bible Society, notice the date, 1804, and the American Bible Society in 1816. These societies and others translated the Bible into more than 1,500 languages. At the same time, missionaries were sent to carry the gospel to land to the ends of the earth. One of the first, William Carey, left for India, notice the date, 1798. Robert Morrison went to China in 1807. Robert Moffat in 1816 went to Southern Africa. And David Livingston in 1841 pioneered missions in Central Africa. And of course, thousands more from the United States and Europe went to every corner of the globe proclaiming the prophetic truths of the Bible. As if suddenly the Bible was unlocked especially the book of Daniel, as we'll see in just a minute. This new awakening, still reading, this new awakening in Bible prophecy culminated in the Millerite movement of the 1840s, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 10, and the proclamation of the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Now, just briefly, in Revelation chapter 10, you have an angel coming down from heaven, he has a little book that he's open in his hand. He sets his one foot upon the earth, his other foot upon the sea. And then he lifts his hand towards heaven and swears by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things that are there in the earth and the things that are there in the sea and the things that are there in, that there should be time no longer. But at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, when he's about to sound, that's Revelation 11, the mystery of God will be revealed as he has declared unto his servants the prophets. So Revelation chapter 10 is describing the opening or the unsealing of the prophetic book of Daniel. It was a mystery up to that point. Revelation chapter 10 is describing this great advent awakening where people started to study the Bible, in particular the book of Daniel, and they began to realize the fulfillment of these time prophecies. Of course, that led to what we call the great disappointment when people based upon a misunderstanding of Daniel 8.14 thought that the sanctuary was the earth, the cleansing of the sanctuary was the second coming. They didn't realize that there was a sanctuary in heaven and the cleansing of the sanctuary was the final work that Jesus was to do in heaven before he comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And after that experience, suddenly they read Hebrews and everything began to make sense and then they proclaimed the first, second, and third angel's message, right? Of course, that's why we are here today. We are here based upon a study of the book of Daniel based upon a realization that Jesus is in his final phase of his high priestly ministry. Soon probation is going to close, and then Jesus will come. Okay, we don't have time to read all those verses, but you've got them in your notes. Verse 4, still reading on, it says, Many shall run to and fro. This is a Hebrew expression meaning diligent searching back and forth in the prophecies of the Bible. 
according to Amos chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles 16. This would be increased, and the little book of Daniel would be open to the understanding of God's people. So knowledge of the prophecies would increase. Revelation chapter 10, 1 and 2, I just spoke about this. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, the rainbow upon his head. His face was like the sun. He had a little book open in his hand. That is the little book of Daniel now being unsealed. Of course, as I read a little earlier, or mentioned a little earlier, Revelation 10, the angel whom I saw standing upon the sea and upon the land raised his hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever and ever, so on, verse 7, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. Now, if you want to find out more about the sounding of the seventh trumpet, you've got to go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, verse 15, talks about what happens in the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We are living in the sounding of the seventh trumpet. But in Revelation chapter 11, just, let me just read the last verse here. It says, Then the temple of God is open in heaven. This is during the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 19. Then the temple of God is open in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple. Now, of course, the earthly temple was a shadow of the heavenly. The earthly had three compartments. It had the courtyard where the lamb was sacrificed, it had the holy, and then it had the most holy place. The courtyard represents the earth because this is where Jesus, the lamb of God, was slain. But when Christ ascended to heaven, he began as our high priest in the first compartment of the heavenly sanctuary, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And he ministered as our high priest, but at the end of the 2300 days in 1844, God the Father and the Son go from the holy place into the most holy place, for this final judgment scene that's during the time of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. That's why the Bible says, I saw the temple open in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant. Where was the Ark of the Covenant kept? Was it in the holy place or the most holy place? Most holy place. So clearly the Bible's telling us that in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, when the mystery of the little book will be revealed, Jesus is going to enter into the most holy place for this final work of judgment. Does that make sense? See how the Bible fits together? Just amazing. Really amazing. All right, moving right along. In addition to the increase of knowledge of the prophetic word, astonishing progress has also been seen in scientific knowledge and the ease of worldwide travel. People shall run to and fro. In the last 150 years, humanity has broken the sound barrier and walked on the moon. Global communication systems and the internet have changed how ordinary people communicate, receive information, engage in everyday activities from virtual meetings to online shopping, and you all know about that. But more specific knowledge has, uh, but all of this, uh, sorry, but more scientific knowledge has not made the earth a safer or a happier place. Is that true? Only the knowledge promised in Daniel 12 verse 4 can offer men and women the power to break the sin barrier in their lives and give them the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Amen. The knowledge found in the Word of God. Verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this side of the riverbank and one on the other side of the riverbank. And that's all I'm going to say about verse 5. I'm going to go to verse 6 because I'm looking at the clock. And one said to the man clothed in linen, that's a reference to Jesus, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? So now another question is asked, how long? Now, we've got to figure out what the wonders are and what these time periods are here in just a minute. Of course, the one clothed in linen is a reference to Jesus. You got that in your notes. All right. Now, third paragraph down in your notes. Some have suggested that the time prophecies of Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 through 13, have a future fulfillment rather than a historical one. While this is interesting, the literary structure of the prophecies of Daniel support a more historical application. Bear with me here. In the structure of the prophecies, the explanation of the prophetic time period is always given in connection to the previous vision and is never given as a separate or standalone prophecy. Now, let me try and explain this. Look at the note and then I'll talk about it. For example, the period of a time, times and a half a time, that's 1260 years of papal supremacy, given in the explanation of the vision of chapter 7, found its fulfillment with the same vision and not at a future point in time. 
In other words, in Daniel 7, you have these four great beasts that come up, and you have the fourth beast that has these ten horns, and a little horn comes up, and the little horn rules for a time, times, and a half a time, and then the angel explains the prophecy and explains what the lion is. Talks about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and the little horn power, the Antichrist power that would arise, and it will rule for a time, times, and a half a time. The angel is explaining the vision that had just been given. So the time period of 1260 days, or literal years, is given in the explanation of a previous time period or time prophecy. It's not some event in the future. Does that make sense? So the time period is always reflective on the vision. It's not predictive for something that has not already been addressed in the vision. That's the pattern, all right? Well, if you keep following that same pattern that we see, likewise, the 70 weeks or the 490 years given in Daniel 9 finds its fulfillment in the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. You see that? So the 70 weeks, the 490 years explains the 2,300 days. It's always connected with the previous vision. Following the same literary structure, the time periods in Daniel 12, which is the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, would also then need to find their fulfillment within the previous prophecy found in Daniel chapter 11 and not at some future point in time, okay? Not, not that there can't be a double application, but I'm just going to follow the historical application. Time prophecies seem to always apply to a previous vision. All right, why is that important? Well, you'll see. Secondly, the time prophecies in Daniel are given using symbolic or prophetic time. And in order for these time prophecies of chapter 12 to be in the future, literal time would need to be used. The only use of literal time in the prophecies of Daniel is the seven times of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity, which was clearly explained to be literal time, meaning seven years. All of the other time periods are symbolic or prophetic. Here's a list, for example. You've got the four beasts, you've got the little horn, the time prophecy connected with that in chapter 725 is time, times, and a half a time. Chapter 8, you've got the ram, the goat, the little horn. The time period connected with that is the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. And then you've got the king of the north and the king of the south, Daniel chapter 11. The time period connected with that is the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335. All right? So let's keep going and see if this fits. Verse 7. Then I heard a man clothed in white linen, again, this is Jesus, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, in other words, Christ is swearing by himself, that it is for a time, times, and a half a time, and then the power of the holy people, when the, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be fulfilled. So here we have a time period, time, times, and a half a time, that's 1260 days. There is one prophetic day, is equal to one literal year. A time is a year. And the Hebrew year consisted of 360 days. Times is two years, and a half a time is a half a year. So you add up the days, 360 plus 360 times two plus a half of 360, it's 1260. One prophetic day is equal to one literal year. So we're talking about a time period of 1260 literal years, okay? The time period referred to as a time times and a half a time is the 1260 years of papal supremacy. And time, of course, is a year, as I just said. And you can look at the references for that. Now, this period began, we have a date for that, in 538 AD. Justinian, the Roman emperor, decreed the pope to be the head of all Christians and the true and effective correct of heretics. In other words, the papacy received civil power or civil authority to enforce its laws using the sword. The papacy's rule continued for exactly 1260 years. Then, right on schedule, in 1798, Napoleon's general Berthier marched into Rome, proclaimed the political rule of the papacy at an end, and took the pope prisoner, thus ending the 1260 years of papal dominance, at least in the political arena. During this time, the power of the holy people was shattered as those who refused to acknowledge papal supremacy faced relentless persecution. And if you're wondering about that, read the book, Great Controversy. You can also read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can read any historian that speaks of the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. It'll be very clear that those who refused to acknowledge papal supremacy faced vicious persecution during the Dark Ages, during this time. Verse 8. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now Daniel had heard the same time period mentioned by Gabriel in chapter 12, verse 4. 
And now it is repeated by Christ himself. But although the prophet heard, he said, I did not understand. Much of what the prophet was shown in vision and faithfully recorded, they did not understand, not just Daniel, but others. Nevertheless, they faithfully wrote it down for us. If God required it, they knew that in due time, God would see that his people derived all of the benefits he intended from their writings. Okay, verse 9. It said, he said, to go your way, Daniel, for these words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So when were these words to be understood? The time of the end. Now remember, the time of the end, we were identified as being the end of the 1260 years of papal supremacy in 1798, right? That's the time of the end. So we're living in the time of the end right now. The book of Daniel was sealed and remained so until the opening or the unsealing by a global proclamation that called people's attention to the prophecies of Daniel. This opening of the only book in Scripture that has ever been sealed is pictured in Revelation chapter 10 and is fulfilled in the 1840s by the proclamation of the first angel's message and the great advent awakening or the Millerite movement. Now, there's a quote here I'm just going to direct your attention to in great controversy. It says, since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies have increased and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. So when was the book unsealed? 1798. We're now living in the time of the end. All right, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and be refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. He's talking about that experience of the Millerite believers that were studying, they came to a clear understanding, but they were refined in the process. Their faith was tested. You don't have time to go into that. You can read the notes on that. Verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, in order for us to understand the 1,290, we spoke about the 1,260. In order for us to understand the 1,290, we need to have a starting point. What's the starting point? Here it says, when the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. Now, when did that happen? Well, in order to understand that, we have to go back to chapter 11, because Daniel chapter 11 actually tells us. Here's the verse. Let me look at the next note. The starting point for the 1290 days is when the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination is set up. Where in Daniel 11 do we read about the daily sacrifice and the abomination of desolation? Well, we do. Daniel 11, verse 31. Notice this verse. And the forces shall be mustered by him... And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they will take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now, if you read the context of Daniel chapter 11, it's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It's long after that. It's talking about the establishment of the papal power. When it talks about the sanctuary fortress, the literal there in the Hebrew is referring to where a place of safety is, a place of refuge. Where is our place of refuge today? the heavenly sanctuary. Why? Because that's where Jesus, our Savior, is. So it's referring to a time period where a counterfeit system of salvation was established by the medieval church. But not only a counterfeit system, the abomination of desolation, but it talks about a force, meaning he receives military strength to enforce his false doctrines. When did that happen in history? Daniel 11.31 refers to the papacy receiving military strength from the forces of the armies of the European nations. This union of church and state opened the way for the papacy to take away the daily sacrifice and to substitute it with the abomination of desolation. The false sacrifice and priesthood of the papal power in the place of the true sacrifice and ministry of Jesus in heaven. Here's the date. In 508 AD. Now remember, the 1260 starts in 538 so this is a little earlier, in 508. The Franks, led by Clovis, the Franks became the French, became the first nation to adopt Roman Catholicism and outlaw all other religions. Happened in France. This began a chain of events that finally led to every European nation accepting Catholicism or the Catholic religion and using civil powers to enforce papal decrees. Thus, in 508, the union of church and state was set up between France and the papacy, which started the 1290 years prophecy. For this reason, France has been called the eldest son of the papacy. It was the first nation 
to use its civil powers to enforce papal decrees. But more than that, it is also important to note that the first of the three horns that were uprooted, the Visigoths, was uprooted by the Franks in 508 AD. This was followed by the Vandals in 534 and the Ostrogoths in 538. Thus, the first of the horns was plucked up at the start of the 1290, and the last of the three horns was plucked up at the start of the 1260. You see that? Very interesting. The same nation, France, that set up the papacy at the beginning of the 1290 is the same power that gave the papacy its deadly wound at the end of the 1260 and the end of the 1290. You understand that? So it's very significant that it was France that established the papacy using its political power, but it's France that took away the political power of the papacy. It established the political power in 12, at, the, at the beginning of the 1290. The papacy was fully established at the beginning of the 1260, but both the 1290 and the 1260 came to an end in 1798. Okay, but there's one more time period. Are you all with me so far? Here we go. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So 1,335. Both prophetic time periods, the 1290 and the 1335, answer the same question asked in Daniel 12 or 6. How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? In, order, so in other words, how long from the daily sacrifice being taken away and the abomination being set up until the fulfillment of these wonders. The date for when the daily sacrifice was taken away and the abomination is set up has already been identified as 508 when the Franks, led by Clovis, uprooted the Visigoths, the first of the three horns which stood in the way of papal supremacy. France also became the first nation in Europe to enforce Catholicism upon its citizens and to use its army to fight on behalf of the Pope. So starting in 508, the first period, the 1290, ends in 1798, whereas the 1335 extends for an additional 45 years and ends in the year 1843. Now, what happened in 1843? Well, let's keep reading. At the beginning of the 1290 and 1335 periods, church and state united and the darkness uh, of papal era settled over Europe. At the end of the 1290, 1798, the political power of the papacy was temporarily broken, which prepared the way for the light of the first angel's message to go to the world. This fulfillment was seen in the great Advent Millerite movement of 1843-1844, in which the prophecies of the book of Daniel were unsealed and proclaimed to a worldwide audience. Does that make sense? Last slide, and then we're done. I'm a little over. After a long life of faithful servant. Let me read the verse, verse 13. But you, Daniel, go your way until the time of the end, for you shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of days. After a long life of faithful servant, the prophet Daniel was assured of his reward at the resurrection of the righteous at the second coming of Jesus. It was not for him to trouble himself over the trials and the tribulations the people of God were to go through before their final deliverance. John states the same idea when he wrote, Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Blessed are those, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they might rest from their labors. Last paragraph. So ends the book of Daniel, one of the most important prophetic books for the people who are living in the time of the end. That's us. By precept and example, Daniel and his three friends have given us a noble standard of godly living in the midst of a corrupt and godless society, a fitting example for us to follow in our world today. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are grateful that you've revealed to us how the story ends. Jesus is victorious. Father, help us always to bear in mind that with you we are on the winning side. Help us not to look to our circumstances or to look at the world around us that is falling apart, but help us by faith to ever look towards heaven where Jesus, our high priest, is interceding for us. And Lord, we're longing for the day when he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to take us home. Keep us faithful. We ask this in his name. Amen. God bless. We're going to take a short break and continue with our worship service.
Good morning, happy Sabbath, Granite Bay. So the song we're gonna sing right now is in your hymnal, page 534. It's called, Will Your Anchor Hold? And the interesting thing to me about this story is I went through a phase when I would jog every morning, I would have to sing this song. And I even made myself learn the words. And I think it's because when I jogged, it was in the morning before work, and I knew that if I sang this song, it would remind me that despite any storm that might break upon me, that I had this anchor that was gonna keep my boat off the rocks. So let's sing this song together because we do have an anchor that will hold. Join us in singing the first and last verse of Shall We Gather at the River, hymn number 432. Beautiful, the beautiful river. 
the last song we're going to sing this morning for our song service is number 88. And if you could all stand with me, please, we're going to sing the first and last verse of number 88. I sing the mighty power of God. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. I want to welcome those who are joining us here. We have some visitors that are worshiping with us this morning. A very warm welcome to you. Also want to greet those who are joining us online across the country and around the world. And for our regular members, if you don't know this, uh, we've got about three to 400 online members that tune in every week real faithfully. They're part of our church family. So we want to greet those of our online members who are tuning in. If you're a first-time visitor, we've got a special gift that we want to tell you about, a book written by Pastor Doug. It's called Finding Life Through Real Faith. This is free. Who do you think you are? We have the book available in the back. We just ask, fill in a visitor's card. It looks just like this. Let us know how you heard about the Granite Bay Church. That's always helpful. You can write down a prayer request. Following the service today as you leave, just give your visitor card to one of our church hosts, and they'll be happy to hand you the book, Finding Life Through Real Faith. So please, take advantage of that. Read the book. You'll be blessed. You can share it with somebody else. Now, we have a number of exciting things happening here at the Granite Bay Church. And so I just want to direct your attention to our announcements. You'll see it there in the back bulletin. The first item that we have is our family game night. That is tonight, starting at 6 o'clock. It's going to be over in our church fellowship hall this is for everyone, uh, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you have little kids, uh, whatever the case, come gather together. We have a worship together. We eat together. We fellowship. Some will pr play some, some board games. There's some activities for the kids. So that's tonight starting at 6 o'clock. Also, we've got a special announcement about the Hilltoppers, and I'm going to have the Hilltoppers make this announcement. I'm not sure Pastor Wolper is going to come out leading going to Elmshaven. Yes, so... Good morning. So I have an announcement, but I thought that I'd bring Luana out with me. It's about our Hilltoppers event this, this next week, April 9 on Tuesday. And Luana, what's going on? Well, we're so excited. We had um, a full bus and uh, due to medical and personal circumstances, we now, it's the bulletin says tw uh, 12 openings. We now have eight openings. And so um, we need to let Elmshaven know by tomorrow. So I'm going to meet any of you who would still like to go uh, at the back um, desk, and we can sign you up today. But you must remember that all those are going to remember to bring a lunch, bring a snack, bring whatever drink you like. Water will be provided. And we're going to have a great day. We need to be there uh, Tuesday morning between 7.30 and 8 so that we can be definitely on our way by 8.30. So I personally want to thank 
Pastor Jeff and Pastor Jean and Diane Kirkuda for all the work that they've done to help us put this together. So I look forward. I hope you will still take advantage and sign up today, and I'll meet you at the back desk. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Jeff, real quick, what is yes. Elmshaven? If somebody doesn't know what that is. Yeah, so Elmshaven is where Ellen White lived the last, what, about decade of her life. She came back from Australia after the 1890s, and she moved to Elmshaven there in Northern around California. The around the 1900s. And she wrote uh, Prophets and Kings was her last book that she wrote there. And uh, I think she wrote all of the book except for the last chapter, and then posthumously it was published. So... Yeah, we're looking forward to going there on Tuesday and doing a history tour of Elmshaven. If you haven't been before, the eight seats will go fast, so I encourage you to go ahead and claim them quick with Lawana. All right, thank you. I've been there a number of times. It is a wonderful experience. So the bus is going to leave early Tuesday morning, so please make sure you get the additional information. I think we do have a few yellow flyers that look like this. They're also in the back. Also want to let you know about an upcoming event next weekend. We have ASI. The Pacific Union chapter of the ASI ministry, they're going to be meeting here. This is going to be their host church for their annual gathering on the West Coast. So they're going to have a program beginning on Friday evening and then a full Sabbath, both in the morning as well as in the afternoon. Now, you're invited to be a part of that because you're part of the Granite Bay Church. So we encourage you to come. Usually you have to register and there's a payment involved for others coming, part of ASI, but because this is our host church, we can be a part of it for free. Praise God for that. So take advantage of this. They have a number of outstanding speakers. The first program is going to be on Friday evening. There are flyers in your bulletin. Did you all receive a flyer? Hold it up, somebody. What does it look like? All right, there it is. If you didn't get a flyer, you want to pick one up on the way out. It'll give you all the details. We do ask, though, if you're going to be staying for lunch next Sabbath, please bring a little extra food we're going to have a full house next Sabbath, so more food would be very helpful for our potluck. And then they have everything planned for the whole afternoon. They've got a musical program. It will be a great blessing. So that's next Friday evening. Friday evening it starts. Also, an announcement about our special needs ministry. There are flyers in the back. This is telling, uh, telling us about an upcoming program, April the 20th from 3 to 5.30, sponsored by our special needs ministry. They're actually planning some outdoor activities at somebody's home. So if you're part of the special needs ministry or you know someone that has a special needs member of the family, please pick up a flyer. Everyone is welcome to come, and you'll be blessed by this event. So that's coming up April the 20th. Also want to remind you about the women's ministry, April 21. So ladies, please take a look at that. There are two events, both taking place on April 21. And then you'll see at the end of our announcement section, we have members who have moved and they're transferring their membership out from the Granite Bay Church. But we also have a number of folks who are transferring into the Granite Bay Church. Uh, this is the first reading. Usually we go through the names at the second reading, but because of ASI being here next week, we want to share with you a little information about those who are transferring into the Granite Bay Church. So I'd like to invite Karen Batchelor. She is our assistant clerk. And we've got some pictures today that we're going to put up on the screen and introduce you to those who are transferring in to the Granite Bay Church, and then we will vote them in as members next week, all right? Officially, we'll be voting them in. And then, uh, actually, we could vote the family in after you go through those names today. We can, we can. Good morning, church family. We're so excited to be able to welcome and introduce you to some of our new members. So if you'll put them up on the screen, we will show you who they are. Brandon Barago is joining his wife, Samantha, whose membership transferred in last in February from the Lodi Fairmont Church, and we're thankful to have him. Kathy Bridgewater is an online member, and she lives in Leesburg, Virginia, and she will be joining us online. And Ryan Cowan, he lives in Orangeville, and he just picked me up um, with the, uh, helping with the, um, the cart, golf cart ministry. So he's already at work. So we're excited about our members that are getting involved in ministry. So he'll be joining us from the Eagle Rock SDA Church. Our next um, member will be Petra Dotson. She lives in Lincoln, California, and she's joining us from the Spokane Northview Adventist Church. 
And the next couple are Jeremy and Nicole Kloppenstein, and they are joining us from the Sacramento Central Church, and they will be part of our Folsom group, and they live in Cameron Park. And Linda Lauder is going to be an online member, and she lives in Denson, Texas, and joining us from Fairview, Texas. Our next two are a father and daughter. John Walker and his daughter Madison are joining us from the Napa Community SGA Church, and we're excited to have them. And Napa's close enough, so I hope they can join us um, in person now and again. Our next uh, a member will be Janet Wynn, and she is family to um, to Freeds. Uh, Freeds. I know the Freeds. Yes. Delicious. So we're excited when our families can join us. So welcome, Janet, and she's coming from the Sacramento Central Church. And our last slide is of a, a, a family, the Florexel family. They were baptized in Miami when Doug and I were there, and they have a very interesting story. They have tried three times to fly out to California to get baptized, but all three times there's been an illness, there's been weather issues. There's been things that have prevented them from arriving here. And so Doug and I were in Miami and we told them and they came down and they joined us. And uh, the Miami Springs Church was so wonderful in um, allowing us to have a baptism for them. So Robin Flor Florexel, he is the father and he shared his testimony that he came from a Baptist background and his wife Martine came from a Catholic background and they were watching Amazing Facts for over 17 years. And it's just uh, now that they've decided to join 100%. And so their children, their adult um, daughter, Brianna Florexel is joining us as well as their daughter, Brittany, and their youngest daughter, Kiera. So we're really excited to have been a part of their baptism and to um, have them join our church family. All right. Well, the Florexel family, I'm sure they're watching right now. So because they baptized, we can vote them into membership today. Amen. So all those who want to welcome the Florexen family to membership here at the Granite Bay Church, raise your hand. And say amen. And say amen. They can hear you. All right. So welcome. Very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Karen, for sharing that. And I'd like to thank our, our clerk team for getting the slides together. That was nice, wasn't it? Being able to connect a name and a face. So we really appreciate them doing that work and putting that all together. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to be singing our call to worship. You'll see the words on the screen. We have this hope. This is the day that you have made, and we are so thankful for the privilege, the opportunity we have to come together as brothers and sisters, your children, to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy to do this, and Lord, help us to make the most of our time to just praise you and glorify you, worship you, learn from your word today. We pray that you'll speak to every heart, encourage those who need encouragement, instruct and inspire. And I pray that as we go from this place, that we'll know that we've been in your presence. We thank you and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. 
It's time for our tithes and offerings, but today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to share with you about a special ministry that the Granite Bay Church has. It's called the Book Ministry. How many of you are aware of the Book Ministry? Some of you. All right. Well, today uh, I've asked Danielle to come. She's been part of the Book Ministry for a while, and she's going to share with us some of the things that uh, she has been involved with. Daniel, how long have you been involved with the book ministry? So I'd say about 10 years plus. Yeah, and it's been a blessing? Oh, huge blessing, love it. Yeah, good. So um, how many books would you say on a typical month that you would give out just as an individual? So on average, I'd say anywhere from five to 20 over the years. Five to 20, and is it, mm -hmm. is it difficult? Is it hard to do, or how, how do you go about this? So no, it's not difficult at all. Um, the, the first thing you wanna remember is that you wanna be in tune with God, and that you involve prayer with this, and um, just be sure that you have the books with you. You can't do it if you don't have the books. Right, so for those of you that may not know, the book ministry, there's a room in the back to, to the right as you walk out, and there's all sorts of literatures, books, pamphlets, uh, study guides. Uh, we have things in Spanish and English. And the whole idea is to equip the church, you, uh, with material to hand out. And uh, as you use it up, we pray that you might donate to restock it. And uh, if you have excess funds and believe in the ministry, we would encourage you to support the book ministry. I'll have to say more about that in a minute. But um, so as you have handed out literature, can you give me like maybe just, we have a short time, but maybe one story of, of uh, you know, handing out literature and what, what this is about? Sure, I can do that. Um, so I'll give you a brief story. If you want more details, you can come talk to me afterwards about um, this story and any other. Um, going on an airplane, uh, there was a person that came in. She was late coming in, sat next to me. We got to talking and she shared with me that, um, she was on her way to a funeral, and that she had recently lost many family members. Well, I had my backpack with me full of my books, and I had this magazine here, The Afterlife. She read this magazine while we were flying, and several times through that said, uh, wow, this is good. And then at the end she said, I needed this. And so anyway, that's just one of many. Yeah, of hundreds. So you had a spirit of prophecy quote you wanted to share. Yeah, quickly. I do. So while she's doing that, I'll just explain a little more. So uh, today the book ministry is open in the back as you leave. If you haven't been in the room to see what we've got, please go in there. Look at the different materials. Uh, you can find something for anybody. If you work with somebody that's interested in history or someone just died or whatever, we have all sorts of literature that you can pick out to distribute. Okay, and I'll leave you with this quote. Let believers be quickened by the grace of Christ to work for the saving of their fellow beings. Let the publications containing Bible truth be scattered like the leaves of autumn. Praise the Lord. I'll just end by adding this. 29 years ago, about this time of year, I was given a great controversy. Never knew an Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist my whole life. Read that book and was converted. It works. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you that we have literature to explain the gospel to people. And even though we're not an evangelist, a preacher, or a teacher, all of us are called and can hand out literature. So we pray your blessing on that. And we pray you bless the offering today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just remind you that we pick up the offering on the way out the back. You can check on your envelope, book ministry, if you'd like to give to it. You can do the same online. Just hit the little plus button because it doesn't come up initially. You can give to the book ministry there as well. And now I'd like to invite the children to come up for our children's story.
Happy Sabbath, children. How are you today? I didn't hear a happy Sabbath back. Hello, are you guys out there? Hi, happy Sabbath. Thank you. I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk to you about missionary work. Um, we just went, if you can put up the first slide, please. What does missionary mean to you? Can somebody tell me what the word missionary means? Does anybody have any ideas? Yes. It means people um, telling Jesus about words, um, the spirit, the Bible, all about all the, over the world. Yeah, it's talking to people about Jesus, huh? And we went to uh, Panama uh, about a week, week and a half ago. I kind of lost track of time, but when when I went, I, you know. Um, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be flying by myself. But you know, God brought me two special friends, Nancy and Shirley, that I didn't even know. And um, what, mission, what missionary means to me is sharing my faith in Jesus and providing services. And that's what we were going to be doing. We were going to be sharing Jesus and providing services. And I was, we, well, they worked in the medical field and I worked in the construction. Oh my goodness. And so we painted, next slide. Hi, that's the next slide. Anyway, what happened? Yeah, and there's Sam and that little boy was five years old. He was out there doing missionary work. He was making gravel. Next slide. <laughs> and there are my painter friends. We were the painter sisters. We painted inside and outside of this church. And it was a lot of work. And we had help, um, some of the community people, which you'll see later on. But um, I just wanted to um, say that missionary work means more than just sharing Jesus, you know, my faith in Jesus and um, providing services. It also means growing uh, so I can be a better missionary, loving people. And God says in, in the Bible, it says in John 13, 14, a new commandment that, I, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And in James 2, 8, it says, love your neighbors as yourself. And these are our neighbors, even though they don't live down the street from us and they live far away, they are our neighbors. Next slide. And there's a little girl that came and we handed out toys to the children there. Next slide. And this little boy, he was making cement and then he came to work painting. And uh, next slide. And this is a father and his son, Jackson. And Jackson was, I think, six, and he was even doing work. Next slide. And these are the ladies in the community that um, came and helped. And so I, I made lots of new friends. Do you like having new friends? Yeah. I love having friends and meeting new people. Next slide. And there's Pastor, and that's Andre. And he was a teenager, so even teenagers came on the trip. Go ahead, next. And there they are working hard. Next one, carrying, yeah, they were working really hard and they were laying flooring. Go ahead, next one. And there they are working on their hands and knees. And next one, and there's a new friend, Kelly. I kind of knew him, saw him at church, but I really got to know him. He's my brother, because he picked on me a lot. <laughs> so, next one. And there we are, the whole group that worked. 
on it was um, the people of the church and the missionary group, and we became family. Next one, and there are all the ladies, all of us ladies that worked on it. Next one, and the guys building the tap, uh, the baptismal. Okay, go ahead. Next one. And there's the pastor and his wife and his children. Go ahead, next one. I think that's it. Okay, so it says in Luke 6, 31, it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These people needed help, and so we went with construction. There was the medical field that came, and medical missionaries that came, and there was the VBS group that came. And we all worked in different areas, but all for the people there. Um, so we, um, so we um, were doing God's work. And in Matthew 7, 12, it says, in, so in everything do to others what we would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, my challenge to you is maybe you can't go to a faraway country to do missionary work, but there's a missionary work to be done right in your neighborhood. And I wrote down some things that I used to do with my children when they were younger and I didn't have the money to do it. Say hi to somebody and tell them how much Jesus loves them. I mean, you can do that, or you can collect socks and blankets for the homeless, uh, collect toys for Shriners Hospital. There's a lot of sick children out there that don't have much, and, and they're very sad. And just taking them a toy and saying hi to them will brighten up their day. Adopting one or two shut-ins, maybe taking them some cookies and just sitting there visiting with them. Um, writing letters to people, walking your street, praying for your neighbors and handing out books. So I, my challenge is we need to be missionaries here in our own home, you know, in our own neighborhoods. So my challenge is find something that your family can do together to um, to spread the word of God and the love of Jesus. Okay, is there anybody that would like to pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this glorious day. And thank you for all the pastors here and all the children. Thank you for everything you gave me, Lord. And thank you for keeping everyone safe to the drive here, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, you may go back to your seats.
Good morning, church. Please stand for scripture reading. Today's reading will be from Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should not tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Please remain standing. We'd like to invite anyone during our prayer song who has a special prayer request to come forward at this time to the front to pray with us. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on bended knee, and we thank you for such a blessed spring day, for all the blessings we have. Lord, you have blessed us immensely, 
And although we're blessed, we see signs of the times and things coming on the horizon that we need to be ready for. And we see opportunities that will be coming to share our faith with others. Lord, we're talking about missions today, and we just pray that you would put in each of our hearts your Holy Spirit with a desire to carry out the mission that you came and that you asked us to finish. Lord, many people have come forward with different challenges. You know what they are. We just pray that you would answer their prayers in a way that would draw them closer to you. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on each of us individually and as a church body. Lord, give us the courage to face the things that are in the way. We know that you are more than willing to give us the Holy Spirit. You're just waiting for us. So let us humble ourselves and let us be willing to turn our backs on the world. Be filled with your spirit and finish your mission, we pray. Lord, we just uh, thank you for how you've blessed in this church. We pray now as Pastor Doug is going to open the word that you would be with him and we pray you would bless as we uh, talk about the mission trip we just returned from. We thank you and ask your blessing on each one here in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. Blessed Sabbath. Welcome. If we have any visitors here to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church, we're just so thankful that you've chosen such a beautiful day to come. And we're glad that uh, spring has sprung, it looks like. I want to welcome those who may be watching with us on AFTV or Facebook or YouTube, one of the many channels on the internet that carries the program. And we also have, we know, online members. They're members of this church that cannot attend a local church that are all over the globe, and we welcome you as well. Now, church is not what happens here for a couple of hours during a week. That's not what makes us a Christian. What really makes us a Christian is what happens out there. Here, we're learning about what to do out there. And as Becky shared during the children's story, you know that uh, Granite Bay, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had returned from a mission trip. We try to go somewhere every year, but we just came back from a trip uh, to Panama, uh, largely staffed by members of Granite Bay, a few visitors, friends of Amazing Facts from around the country, and it was a really great experience. Uh, there'll be future opportunities that you'll hear about, but uh, we thought that we'd dedicate part of the time this morning. I am going to share a shortened sermon so we'll try to keep with our regular time. But uh, we thought that we'd share with you just some sound bites and some testimonies, a little video of what's, what happened during that week. We're going to begin with a video that is in Spanish. This was prepared by Hope Channel in Central America that reported on our meetings. So it's going to be in Spanish, but you'll have English subtitles. So we'll begin with that, and then Pastor Ross will come out. He'll uh, be interviewing some of the people that participated and I'll wrap things up with a message from God's Word. Es el propósito de Dios que su pueblo sea un pueblo consagrado, purificado y santo, que comunique luz a cuantos le rodean. El Ministerio Amazing Facts visita por primera vez Panamá con más de 240 voluntarios, quienes junto al equipo de trabajo de la Asociación Central Panameña, con grandes expectativas, todos unidos en una sola misión, la salvación de las almas. Con mucha emoción por la tarea a realizar, enfocaron su trabajo en tres proyectos misioneros, la gira médica realizada en el Instituto de Habilitación Especial IPE, ubicado en La Chorrera, donde más de 60 profesionales de salud de distintas especialidades atendieron un aproximado de 1,700 personas, a las que no solo dieron atención médica, sino también instruyeron en el conocimiento del amor que tiene Cristo Jesús por ellas. En 
segunda gira, destacamos el esfuerzo misionero del Departamento de Niños al llevar a cabo la experiencia bíblica de vacaciones, donde muchos niños con necesidades especiales pudieron aprender y desarrollar destrezas y habilidades. Mientras tanto, en el área de Nuevo Emperador, otro grupo de voluntarios trabajó arduamente en la construcción del nuevo templo de Princesa Mía. Allí, bajo el sol y lluvia, todos unidos hicieron su mayor esfuerzo para que el plan de ver un gran templo en este lugar sea una realidad. Aferrados a la promesa de Jeremías 29.11 que dice, Porque yo sé muy bien los planes que tengo para vosotros, afirma el Señor, planes de bien y no de mal. Al mismo tiempo, en el sector de Guadalupe de la Chorrera, otro grupo de voluntarios testificó del amor de Dios en la construcción del Templo de Loma de Guadalupe. Niños, jóvenes, adultos, pintaron, pulieron, batieron mezcla con mucho entusiasmo, logrando así dar un gran avance a este bello templo. Al final de esta bendecida semana y con la alegría que causa el deber cumplido, el equipo de Amazing Facts y toda la hermandad de la Asociación Central se unió en un culto de gratitud, donde por la gracia de Dios, muchas almas entregaron su vida a Jesús. Durante más de 40 años, el ministerio Amazing Facts se ha comprometido con proclamar el mensaje de los tres ángeles de Apocalipsis y a cumplir la gran comisión de Jesucristo. En esta ocasión, no fue la excepción. La mano poderosa de Dios continúe guiándoles hoy y siempre. Por lo tanto, deseamos agradecer a cada uno de los voluntarios, pastores y esposas, familias, amigos y hermanos en Cristo, a la Comisión de Alimentación, a todo el equipo de traductores, de comunicación, a la Administración del Instituto de Habilitación Especial por facilitarnos sus instalaciones, al Ministerio de Salud de Panamá Oeste por decir presente, a los administradores de la Asociación Central Panameña, a los administradores de la Unión Adventista Panameña y, por supuesto, al equipo de voluntarios del Ministerio Amazing Facts por apartar parte de su valioso tiempo, recursos y talentos en pro de la predicación del Evangelio y la transformación de vidas en el territorio panameño. Damos honra y gloria a Dios porque jornadas como estas capacitan alientan e inspiran a muchos a contribuir para el reino de Dios. Maranata. Gracias. Amen. Well, as you can see, there was a lot that happened on our mission trip to Panama. What's not mentioned in the video is that it was 98 degrees and 100% humidity in the shade. I don't know if it was that bad, but it felt like that, especially for our construction team. No air conditioning, working outside. We had a great team, about 240 people. I know there's a number of online members that participate, and they're watching right now. So uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to get sort of a first-hand account of some of the experiences that people had. 
and uh, Dr. Roger Shane was heading up the medical outreach that we had, and he's going to share with us some of the numbers of how many people we helped, and then we have a testimony about the medical outreach. All right, thank you, Pastor Ross. So as Pastor Ross mentioned, I was blessed with the opportunity to co-lead the, the medical team with Dr. Ken Mandura, our medical director, Audrey's husband. Um, and it was really a blessed experience overall. You know, we're told that the medical ministry work is to serve as the great entering wedge by which the truth for this time is to be made known. And so our whole team of over 60 healthcare providers were very blessed to have the opportunity to serve our brothers and sisters there in Panama. So we had met with our contacts on the ground uh, there in Panama for months leading up to uh, our clinic there. And during our, term, uh, our time there, we prayed for the Lord's blessing. And over those four days of clinics, we were able to see nearly 1,800 combined medical and dental patients. Amen. 1,800. That's amazing. You should have seen the lines of people waiting to get medical care. And I understand that when it came to the medical providers, they had to work quickly and efficiently because there were people standing outside waiting. So, but there were testimonies. Yes, and Audrey Manduro is one of our family nurse practitioners who was part of our provider team there, and she's going to share a testimony with us. <laughs> okay, um, so, you know, in these mission, mission trips, um, pediatric medicine is always, always in high demand. And so that is an area that I decided to help, help out in. And um, I just want to share one particular encounter that I had with one of my patients. And this happened on our last day uh, of clinic. And it was towards the end of the day. And this mother showed up with two of her children. Um, one of them was a 13-year-old boy, and he seemed to be healthy, and you know, he, he was just there for a well-child visit. And she also brought her 10-year-old daughter, who looked to me like she was very small. In, you know, as a 10-year-old, she just looked very s small for her age. And um, so I plotted I, I her. I've got to interrupt you for yes. a second. I've got to just cue out. The slides need to wait a minute. I've got to say something about those slides. And you guys are getting a sneak preview. So let's back out the slides <laughs> and let's focus on the testimony. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I plotted her numbers on the growth chart. And um, all her numbers were way below, like the fifth percentile um, in height and weight and in head circumference. Normally, we don't measure head circumference on 10-year-olds, but um, this mother told me that her daughter had a brain malformation. Um, and so I was just curious, you know, what her head circumference was. And so all her numbers were way, way below the growth chart. And her mother told me that her little girl was born with a condition called um, agenesis of the cor corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is the part of the brain that contains like nerves that connect the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And since she was born with, uh, without this part of her brain, she had several um, neurological and motor deficits. And so I thought, I said a quick prayer to God, and I just prayed, God, you know, what, what can I do for this little girl? And um, so I had asked the mom, like, when was the last time, you know, she saw the doctor? And the mom said, oh, um, it had been years, you know, uh, because they have poor access to health care that, the mom just basically gave up on taking her kid to the doctor. And by the way, this little girl had a seizure disorder as well. And so I asked, so how have you been getting her medications, you know, to control her seizures? And she said that, you know, every time her daughter had a seizure, that she would just bring her to the emergency room. And that's how she had been getting her medications. And so I thought, well, you know, this little girl um, needs to be referred to, 
to a specialist. And so I, I excused myself and I went and looked for the, the local doctor and I found him and I presented the case to him and I said, could you please help me uh, write referrals for, referrals for this little girl? And um, since, you know, I don't have, I'm not licensed to practice in Panama, we had a local doctor who um, collaborated with us, healthcare providers, and all, all the referrals and, and prescriptions were written under his medical license and his name. And so the doctor came and uh, he, he gave me a crash course on Spanish uh, medical terminology <laughs> and he helped me write all those referrals. And um, of course, all the communication that I had with this family happened uh, with the help of my Spanish interpreter. And that day it happened to be one of our church members, um, our church uh, clerk, Ladies Bell Ayala, she, she was my Spanish speaking half <laughs> in clinic that day. And so I was able to give her all those referrals and the mom was just so thankful because she told me that, you know, just to see a doctor, it takes months, you know, to get an appointment and then to get a referral and to finally see the specialist, it can take several more months, you know, and so just getting that referral um, was a big progress in, uh, you know, getting that child's uh, medical care um, needs. And so as I contemplated on that encounter, you know, I started asking God, like, God, how is this girl supposed to glorify you in her life? Like, she can't even walk, she can't talk, she can't really, you know, she can't do anything, like, meaningful. And, you know, God spoke to me, and, and he said, you know what, Audrey, it's not about what she can do, it's about what I can do. And, you know, God used that little girl to remind me of that very important truth. And um, when I realized that, you know, I, I praised God and I said, even though that girl, you know, couldn't talk or walk, you know, she's still glorifying God in her life because she, she is testifying of God's love to humanity. And I, I realized that I'm not... Uh, just as imperfect as she as imperfect as she is, I'm also imperfect, and yet, you know, God still loves me, and God died for that little girl, and died for all humanity, you know, because He loves us, and Amen. so praise God, you know, and Amen. to God be the glory. <laughs> and that's one story of many lives that have impacted in a big way through the mission trip and through the work that was done. So we want to thank all of our medical team that was involved in this effort. Thank you so much. But not only did we do medical outreach, we also, well, part of medical was dental work. And I'd like to invite Dr. Laredo. He's got a short testimony. Uh, not only do you need the dentists and you need, you know, the personnel to help folks, but when it comes to this, you need equipment. And a lot of the equipment was brought, but some of the equipment we were dependent upon the local people there in Panama to provide, and that's where we have an answered prayer. Dr. Laredo. Well, the, um, my test of faith in Panama was uh, due to the, the amount of compressed air we needed. We had uh, made um, an emphasis to our uh, Panamanian counterparts uh, that we needed a certain amount of compressed air. I had said 60 minimum, 120 ideal. Uh, of gallons of compressed air. Well, uh, when we got there to Panama and set up the clinic, they were so proud because they got me exactly the amount of air they, they thought I, I had asked. They had 120 liters of compressed air, which is only 31 gallons. And I said, oh boy, Lord help me. And, uh, and uh, 
And in addition to that, their larger compressor, the 80 liter compressor, was broken. So we actually only had a 40 liter compressor, which is only like about 13, 12, you know, gallons, or something, no, about 12 gallons. That would only run basically two units. And we had 12. And so I, I had to, you know, take a time and just, in my head, set a prayer. And I said, Lord, help us, because this is not going to work. And uh, I called uh, on Pastor Gonzalez and, Pastor, and Dr. Britton that were there. And I said, we need more air. This is not going to work. So they were able to get us an old compressor, a uh, 60-gallon compressor that, was, that came out of an auto shop that had, that had uh, closed. And uh, with that, and uh, Mr. Suave, the, our electrician, they were able to connect this compressor to the, to the building. And, uh, and, and that was great. We thought we had it made. After the first after the first day, that compressor had blown the, a, a, um, the oil plug. plug, and all the oil had spilled on the ground. But we finished the day. And um, thank God we finished the day. And so they came during the evening, and they fixed it. So I said, OK, we have it made. In the middle of the second day, one of the airlines from the compressor broke. and. Uh, I, everything had to stop. I had to run over there, and we had to splice that little piece of plastic thing, and, and it made it work again. And so that was the second day. The third day, the same thing happened again. Oh, man, the Lord, uh, the, the devil did not want us to see uh, the patients we wanted, wanted to uh, see. And, and again, uh, finally, I, I, I already knew what to do, so we spliced it again. And... Um, and it, it, stayed, it stayed working till the end. I, I, I thought the fourth day, oh, sure, it's going to break again. <laughs> no, it didn't. And thank God. Uh, so it tested my faith because uh, without air, uh, no dentistry would have been done. And the number of patients we saw in dentistry was, I believe, 558. They would not have been done if uh, the Lord had not intervened. Amen. Well, that's the answer of prayer. Dr. Laredo mentioned it in the evening worship. He says, we've got to pray. The compressor's not working. We all prayed. Well, the Lord answered the prayer, and we were able to see Amen. a lot of people. Thank you, Dr. Laredo. Well, in addition to the medical and the dental work, we worked with the kids. I'd like to invite Pastor Wolper over, and he's going to share a little bit about our outreach for the kids, the VBS program. You've got one and a half minutes, brother. I okay. can say this to him because he's one <laughs> of the team. Thank you, Pastor John. So uh, who here would consider themselves an adaptable, flexible person? Well, I tell you what, if you want to test that theory, come with us to a mission trip next year. <laughs> um, you know, missionary work is always an opportunity to serve the Lord and to dispense his love and grace to others. And it's also an opportunity to see how adaptable you are. One of the key qualifications of a missionary, other than following Jesus with all your heart, is to be adaptable. I want to read this to you. From our colleges and training schools, missionaries are to be sent forth to distant lands. While at school, let the students improve every opportunity to prepare for this work. Here they are to be tested and proved that it may be seen what their adaptability is mm. and whether they have a right hold from above. VBS, our team, had a plan, and praise the Lord for our leaders, both Sally and Pixie. They had an organized plan. Everything was set to go, and then guess what happened? We had to basically scrap our plan because the government official says you're not allowed to basically do this VBS at this public school. So now what are you going to do? So we prayerfully got together, and the Lord helped us to adapt and we were able to visit a Seventh-day Adventist school and do a VBS program and do some programs for the elementary kids and then for the high school kids as well. And it was really exciting. We brought up the high school students. We invited them to come forward with testimonies. And if anybody remembers high school, um, one of the hardest things to do for high school students is stand in front of your peers and to stand in front of your peers and share from your heart. And I was really impressed. We had three high school young men 
that shared from their heart. And I wish you could have been there to hear the testimonies. It was so powerful. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you, please do mission work where you are right now and, and plan also to support foreign missions as well. If not with going, send your monies as well. There is a desperate need to take this gospel to all the world. And every church member is to be adaptable in, in part of that work. So thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. And then one of the last areas of ministry that we did was on the construction side. And this was hard work. As I mentioned, I told you what the weather was. Uh, but Sam's team did an outstanding job. There were actually two building sites that we were involved with. A lot of work was done. Hard work. Mixing cement and laying block and pouring concrete and putting in tile. But probably the thing that impressed us the most, and, and Sam's going to mention this, uh, just the team spirit that was there. Sam, well, what experience impressed you? Yeah, you know, he wasn't exaggerating about it being 97 <laughs> degrees and 80% humidity. It was unbelievable. There was times when literally guys were <laughs> weak in the knee and had to take a break. But um, it, was, it was really something to see the camaraderie, to see uh, even members that we don't know how they work or whatever, to see them working together and dealing with issues and problems. And there always are problems. But what I was so amazed at is we, we were told that there was a certain amount was supposed to be done. And, and of course it wasn't. And we wanted to see the foundation done. And the locals were like, there's no way, guys. It's maybe halfway. Well, the group of guys that were there, they said, no, we're going to do it. And so they said, let's keep the bus later. Let's just work hard. Let's get it done. Matter of fact, they even said, you know, there's no way we're going to move all this dirt and dig all this. Can't we get a backhoe? So they themselves went together and said, we're going to pitch in. We're going to bring in a backhoe. We're going to get this done. And they did. I mean, it was amazing. Backhoe came in and did more work in six hours than we could do in a week. It was incredible. And so even when we were forming, we were getting ready to pour. They were going to bring concrete truck out. I said, there's, there's no way we're getting past halfway. I said, oh, yeah, yeah keep the bus late. Let's stay late. Let's get it done. Amen. And we said, well, we're going to need more wood. It's like, oh, let's go get more wood. So we weren't waiting. We were just getting it done. We weren't waiting for anybody's permission or whatnot just to go and get it done. And we poured it all. It was amazing. It's it amazing. Was we're going to see some pictures here of some of the work that was done in construction. I went out and visited the sites. And I, as, as Sam said, just the spirit, the hard work. Uh, it was exciting to see the difference they made. And of course, the folks are so appreciative. Oh, of yeah. what was oh, happening there with the outreach. You should have seen them uh, when they're sitting there all, all in Spanish. Some of you understand, but they're like, Míralo el famoso Pastor Doug. Míralo trabajar. <laughs> Trabaja más que los otros. Míralo. Ahí está. It was, it was pretty amazing. They just, uh, you know, he's a celebrity around the world, right? And to see him there getting his hands dirty and working hard, it's just so, uh, it's, a, it's, it's so encouraging Amen. for everyone, you know, Amen. to see that we want to spread the gospel. We want to do what we can to save as many as possible. Amen. And that's what we're Well, thank for. you, Sam. We appreciate Sam's leadership. Yes. Actually, we appreciate the leadership of all of the teams. 240 people. That's a lot of folks to organize. Uh, we really want to thank Carlos and Cecily. They're not here today. They're actually on a mission trip in South America right now. But they helped to organize it and many others behind the scenes that put it all together. We've got about uh, a minute and a half of slides. We're going to run that right now. You saw some of it, but I want to share as we do the slides, I want to tell you a little bit about what you're seeing because this is our Granite Bay mission trip. That's where the country of Panama is. You can see it connecting South America. This was the welcome to the group that arrived. There were many people coming on different flights, and so they came in at different times. But the local there, the church, they welcomed us. We loaded up all of our stuff on bus and we bust out to where we were staying. And then every morning at 8 o'clock, the bus left and went out to the different outreach areas. These are some pictures from the medical group. You can see people lining the street waiting to come in, whether it's dental work or medical work. We had a group meeting that we're giving practical health lectures as the people are waiting. And you can see the team of people coming in and they're preparing. That's all the instruments that were used in the dental work. And uh, they were doing blood checks and all other kinds of medical procedures for the people there. Even they were doing um, echocardiograms on some of the patients. And of course, a lot of removal of teeth and fillings and uh, blood pressures and counseling. All of this was involved in the medical team's outreach. And there you have a picture of some of the medical team. We had young people that were involved. They were running back and forth, bringing patients to the different stations. We want to thank James and John for their good work, and we had to keep tools away from these ladies. 
They thought they'd take matters in their own hands. And then, of course, we had the kids helping with all kinds of things and providing supplies. Lots of children that came through the program, and we were able to work with them. It was exciting to see the response from the kids and praying with the patients. That was a big deal, praying with the patients, lifting them up before the Lord. That's really the goal of the medical reach, to connect them with Jesus. Here's the construction project, as mentioned by Sam. That's one of the locations. There were two. This church uh, got painted. We uh, put in another layer of concrete on the floor, and they started to lay tile. This was one of the big projects. Painted the whole church, put in windows. Everyone was involved. They were busy smoothing the concrete. Uh, even a local church member's family and his little boy came with his wheelbarrow, and he was pouring concrete too. But there the team is. They're busy putting in the tile. I want to thank everybody for their hard work. The church just looks totally different. Just in four days, remarkable the change that occurred. We had to watch Pastor Carlos. He drove over a little kid's chair along the way. They built a baptistry. They put that in the church as well, and that's what they're busy working on. We got Pastor Doug between his preaching to do some painting, and there he is. That's how it began. That's actually before we came. They were able to put the walls up, and that's the way we left it. So a nice improvement on the church, and of course the local group was very appreciative of everyone that helped with the group. This is the other building site that Sam was talking about, pouring the foundation. This was hard work, digging, mixing cement, laying block, bending rebar, and everyone there worked really, really hard. They don't use a mixer, they mix by hand. It's the way they do things there and they bend the rebar by hand. So there was just a lot of things that were happening. This is false advertising. This, uh, I wasn't really doing much. I don't know why they had me take a load. I was just visiting the sites. <laughs> but they did work hard. The locals really worked. That's kind of part of the foundations, and that's the way they left it. You can see they've poured the key foundation areas, and now they can go ahead and pour in between. The VBS program, as we mentioned, we started the school, but uh, the government got involved and they said, no, we can't do it on the public area. So we went to the Avenue School, and we had a lot of kids that came out, both with the elementary school, also with the high school kid, high school age kids. We sang with them, as you can see. They had a chance to share some stories and some testimonies. It was really a good experience for everyone that was involved. Pastor Jeff was our lead pastor that was there, and he did the worships in the evening for our group. And then on the weekends, we did a big rally. Pastor Doug, myself, Carlos translated more than 4,000 people that were there for that final rally. We rented out a convention center there in Panama, and uh, the response was just fantastic. Uh, it was wonderful to hear the people sing and just fellowship with them and worship with them. They were there all day, all day Sabbath at this convention center, and they were the ones that prepared the video that you saw a little earlier. So... Here's the group, 240 people that went. Uh, most of them, I think almost all of them are there, but a big thank you to all of those who participated, and thank you to the Granite Bay Church for helping to fund this project. We could not have done it without you. So let me ask, uh, anyone that was on the Granite Bay mission trip, can you stand, if you're here, can you stand, all of those who are on the Granite Bay mission trip, just stand wherever you are, and you can see the team <laughs> spread throughout the church representing the Granite Bay Church and doing a good work of ministry and evangelism. Thank you. You may be seated. And as I mentioned, there were many people that joined us also from our online community, and some amazing facts folks were also part of the program. So all in all, it was a great blessing. Now we catch our breath, and we get ready for next year. So we'll be giving you more information as we get closer. Thank you. We'll turn the time over to Pastor Doug. Amen. Amen. That's just so uh, encouraging. You know, one thing, I don't know if it was mentioned, I couldn't hear it backstage, but along with the medical work and the VBS work, the construction work, the evangelistic meetings, uh, Pastor Ross and Carlos and I, we did pastoral training. We were teaching evangelism to the pastors that were there, and they really appreciated that as well. So this was a very productive time. Well, we're going to talk about a mission story. We're going to talk about a missionary. And our sermon message, and it'll be shorter, so don't sweat, <laughs> is actually from the Bible. The, the title is Astonished Beyond Measure. And it's based on our scripture reading that we had a little earlier that you find in the book of Mark. And this story of this miraculous healing is only found in the book of Mark, chapter 7, and it's the last paragraph there. 
And it says that in verse 31 is where we'll start. It explains that Jesus was a traveling preacher. It says, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Zidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had been doing some ministry up where the Phoenicians live. This is one of the rare times that he sort of went out of the borders of Israel. You remember he healed the daughter of this woman. The daughter was demon-possessed. And then he goes, it's like a 75-mile at least walk, goes back down, goes across the Jordan River to the eastern side of Galilee and south. There's an area called Decapolis. It was largely another Gentile area. And it's, you probably could figure it out, metropolis, polis, a city, Deca, 10. It was 10 Greek cities. And it was run by Syria. And he's in that area. It's around Galilee. So his ministry was all around Galilee. You know, you study the life of Christ in three and a half years. He went through the southern kingdom of Israel. He went through Judea. He went into the desert. He went down to Jordan River. He went up north. He went up to Syria. He went all the way around the Sea of Galilee. Jesus covered the land of Israel the way he wants us to cover the earth. You know, Christ said, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but I want you to go into all the world. And so Jesus practiced what he preached. He traveled quite a bit. Mark chapter 138, he said to them, let us go into the next towns. He'd get done in one town, he'd go to the next, that I might preach there. For this purpose I have come forth. And while he's now in this area of Decapolis, and he's teaching, he did a sermon on the mount down there, they're bringing in people to heal. This one particular healing stood out for Mark, and he, and he gives us more detail. In verse 32, Then they brought him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. So this man, he can see, and he can walk, he can move, but he can't hear, and if you can't hear, if you're born not being able to hear, you can't speak well. You have vibrations, and you've probably known people before that are deaf, and they may talk and or try and moan and articulate, and they did not have speech therapists back then. So his problem is he cannot understand and he cannot be understood. That is very frustrating. You know, I'll, I'll make a confession. As I get a little older, my hearing is getting worse, or everybody's talking is getting worse. I'm not sure which it is. <laughs> Karen says my hearing has been bad since we got married. But <laughs> that's a different story. And sometimes when we're visiting after church and I'm in the lobby, and you got a lot of background noise, it's hard to hear. Anyone else like that? And so if you're talking to me, and, and I'm smiling, and I'm nodding, and you say, I just murdered my grandmother, I'll go, praise the Lord. Because... <laughs> I, I may not know exactly what you said. It's kind of hard, and it's frustrating when you can't be understood and you can't understand. And so Jesus, they, they said, handsome, bright man, but he's deaf. Can you do anything for him? And they said, will you lay your hands on him? They thought, you know, through touching, you know, Jesus can heal. He'd done it several times just by speaking. But they said, would you lay your hands on him? And Jesus is getting ready to do something remarkable, and, and he doesn't want it to get out because he's already got a lot of enemies working against him. So he takes him aside. You could read in verse um, 33, Mark chapter 7. And um, he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers in his ears. Now, why does he do this? And it tells you he, he touches his lips with some spit. He puts his fingers in his ears. Well, I think the reason that Jesus goes through acting out what he's doing is this man could see fine, and so Jesus is basically doing a pantomime. They had no sign language back then. He's kind of letting the man know what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to open your ears, and I'm going to heal your tongue. And he looks up to heaven indicating that God is going to do this for you because, you know, it can be really frustrating when you can't hear. Now, of all my senses, I think I appreciate sight the most light and sight. And Jesus healed many blind people. It often mentions his healing the blind in connection with his healing the deaf. But then not hearing or not speaking would be really frustrating for a pastor. And uh, I think we all know that when you don't hear well, 
it affects your speech because you can't hear yourself. Have you ever known somebody as they get a little older, they can't hear and they get them a hearing aid and they talk and they don't know how loud they are? I had one saint in a little church where I was pastoring and he'd turn, he'd say something to his wife. He'd think he's whispering. The whole church heard what he said. <laughs> and he'd sit right up front hoping he could hear better. And he turned to his wife. He'd say, it's a quarter after. Is he ever going to quit? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and then everybody would laugh and <laughs> we'd all hear what he said. <laughs> and the poor guy, some of you remember the old hearing aids that they'd squeal. They'd get like feedback or something if you turned them up too high. <laughs> and everybody in the church would hear his hearing aid squealing. And we didn't know if it was an air raid siren or what it was. And he couldn't hear it. And his wife would have to elbow him and say, fix your hearing aid. And, huh? He's, poor guy. But um, when you can't hear, you talk a little louder. and You can't hear yourself. And it can be frustrating. So he takes his man and he, he brings him to the side from the multitude. And he puts his fingers in his ears. Now, why his ears? Now, anytime Jesus healed, there's also going to be a spiritual application. Seven times in Revelation, what does Jesus say to the church? He that has ears, let him hear. Now, some people have perfect hearing, but they don't hear God. They have perfect pitch. They can tell you when a music note is not played correctly, but they don't hear the Holy Spirit. And the Lord is telling us He wants to heal our hearing spiritually. So we're listening to His Word. And what does it mean for a Christian to hear? To not just hear, but to do something about it. Amen? He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Mark 8.18 Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? So sometimes you can have ears, but we're not hearing the Lord. You know, nothing is more dangerous than when a person starts to grieve the Holy Spirit. They turn down the volume by ignoring. It's like the teenager. The alarm is going off to tell them to wake up for school, and everybody in the house hears it. It's right by their head, and they don't hear it because they've gotten so used to ignoring it. You ever visit someone that like lives by the train track or the airport and you're visiting with them and all of a sudden a train goes by and the whole house shakes and you say, how do you live with that? I go, with what? <laughs> or you're talking to them. I've been visiting people. They live right at the takeoff zone of the airport. And while I'm talking to them, the house is shaking. As the jet goes over, it roars. And, and you go, wow, that must be tough. What? The planes. Oh, we don't, we don't hear it anymore. Let's get used to it. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, it convicts us. But the more often you ignore that voice, you can get to the point where you don't hear it anymore. That's when you're in danger of grieving away the Holy Spirit. How many want God to heal our ears so that uh, they're unstopped and we hear His voice? You know, sometimes you've got to pop your ears. When you're driving down from Tahoe, 7,000 feet, and you come down to almost sea level in Sacramento. And I know many times I'm on my way down the hill, and maybe we got a tape or something going, or Karen's talking to me, and she says, you're not listening. And this time I have a good excuse. I realize, oh, we've just dropped 3,000 feet. And I'll pop my ears and go, wow, that's much better. <laughs> I can hear now. And we need the Lord to sometimes open our ears like that. So he puts his fingers in his ears, and then he does something unusual. It says, he spat and he touched his tongue. Now, we're not, I don't think he spat on his tongue. I think what Jesus did is he spat on his fingers and he touched his tongue. Now, how many of you, when you read that, you kind of thought, ooh. <laughs> you know, it does actually say in the Bible in Leviticus that if someone spits on you, especially if they're sick, you're to go wash your clothes and you are unclean until the evening. And I remember my grandmother telling me, you know, at some point as you're growing up, your parents tell you what's clean and what's unclean. And uh, I remember my grandmother saying, I, I spit on somebody or something. She said, that's dirty. Don't do that. So you can understand my consternation when I was in a public place and my grandmother spit on her fingers and used it to wash my face. 
Anyone? Who'll fess up? I mean, you got to work with what's at hand, I guess. But my mom never did that. But my grandma was from another school. And uh, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get home and clean grandma's spit off my face. <laughs> but let's face it. How many of you are married? Do you ever get a little spit from someone else when you're kissing? <laughs> I mean, we don't think that much of it. Uh, so this is Jesus. He is holy. And I think there's something that's practical here. In, in speech, you have saliva to moisten your voice because it makes it easier to talk. You realize if you have no moisture in your throat, your vocal cords, or your mouth, you can't speak. So Jesus taking his holy saliva and touching this man's tongue, he's sort of reenacting a miracle. And then as he does this, and, and people are watching, th this man is, he's, I think, very expectant. He's got faith. He's wondering, why is he going through this? Jesus is animating. He's doing a pantomime for this man because he understands sign language. So Jesus is acting out what he's about to do for him. He can't tell him, but he could see. And then it says, looking up to heaven. You know, so often when Jesus healed, I just, um, in preparation for this message, I've got thousands of pictures of Jesus healing. Maybe not thousands, hundreds. And looking over all of them, Jesus is always looking at the person he's healing. This is one where Jesus is not looking at the person. He's looking up to heaven. There's no artist I could find who's painted that. Christ, I think, is trying to demonstrate God is about to do something for you. So he looks up to heaven and puts his fingers in his ears, touches his tongue, and then he says something, Ephratha, which, and the reason that it's actually written out in Greek, they write it in, it's actually a Syrian phrase, which is, uh, it's a type of Aramaic. He says it in the language of this man. You realize that God is multilingual. You can pray in whatever language you're in, and he understands you. And while I'm on this point, I may as well hit it, and then I'll move on. You're going to run into people that are going to tell you that when you say the name of Jesus, you're actually using a Greek pronunciation, and it's related to the word Zeus, and it's a pagan word, and you need to call Jesus Yeshua. Have you ever run into that before? And there are Bibles that translate the whole Bible, so they take out the name Jesus and they substitute the name Yeshua, which Yeshua would be the Hebrew way to say his name, which is Joshua. But God expects us to speak in our language. You realize in every language you pronounce things different. And the way that it was translated from Greek, Joshua is translated Jesus. Look in Hebrews chapter 4. You'll see where it says, if Jesus had given them another day, why would he have spoken of another? It's talking about Joshua in the Old Testament. It pronounces it Jesus. That's the Greek. If you remember the old King James, when it said Elijah, it said Elias. When it said Noe, it said Noe. The words translated different. We don't even know how to say some of those names in the original language. So if you feel convicted, you want to say it that way, fine. But I can assure you that God understands many languages if you're Spanish, you can say, Jesus, he understands. You see what I'm saying? So don't get hung up on that, that you've got to pronounce that there's some kind of magic in praying and saying God's name a certain way. It's going to open up Aladdin's cave or something. Don't fall for that. God is, that's not how he operates. And so he says, Ephrathah. And that means be open in that Syrian Aramaic tongue. And he looks up to heaven. Why did he sigh? It says he sighed. Why did Jesus weep at Lazarus' tomb? He was getting ready to resurrect him. The Lord's getting ready to heal this man. Usually when you sigh, it's almost like you're discouraged. You know, I think, and we can only speculate, but when I read it, this man has gone his whole life without being understood or being able to understand. It says he had a speech impediment. And I won't imitate it because you might think it's disrespectful, but you know, sometimes people who are deaf 
all they can do is moan and groan. And they don't, they're trying to, the parents maybe understood them a little bit, but he couldn't speak. He couldn't be understood. People would look at him funny when he tried to make a sound. And I think Jesus was sighing with empathy for the way this man had suffered. I think he's also sighing in behalf of the whole human race that does not understand and cannot be understood. You know what a blessing the word is in communication? I'm standing here right now, and if the lights go off, I could keep talking, and you'd still get the picture. We don't know what Jesus looked like, but we know what he said. There's power in the word. Jesus is the word incarnate. The world does not understand what God is saying. And Jesus looked up to heaven, and he sighed. It's like he's groaning. Paul describes this in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. Some, you ever pray, you don't know exactly what to say? But God knows. It says, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That word groanings there is the word sighings. The Spirit sighs. And what does Jesus say? Ephratha, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Now, this is a first-class miracle because this man did not have a vocabulary he'd never heard. Suddenly, he knows how to speak. He, when God made Adam, you know, when you teach your children how to say words, and how many of you remember the first word that your children spoke? How many of you, their first word was no? <laughs> You're laughing because I think it's... Yeah. Nathan's first word was stuck. He was, uh, we were digging in the garden with a trowel, and I stuck the trowel on the ground so I could put the plant, the flower in the hole, and he tried to pull up the trowel, and he couldn't get it up. I said, is it stuck? And he said, stuck. I never would have dreamed that would have been his first word. <laughs> stuck. So we learn little by little, but... This man, all of a sudden, he's speaking clearly, and he's got a Webster's vocabulary. It's like Adam. Did Adam have to learn how to speak? Or did he come factory pre-installed? Plug and play. He must have known how to speak, because God said, not only can you speak, I want you to name all these animals. Right? He was able to name and catalog all the animals. Adam could speak. This man, it's a miracle not only of his tongue and his ears, it's a miracle in his mind that he was healed. Now, the, the crowd is shocked, and this man is talking. He's talking to his parents. He's talking to his friends. He's praising the Lord. He says, wonderful. Oh, he's got so much to say. And what does Jesus do? Jesus now gives him an impossible command. You know, I think we should obey every command of the Lord, but this would have been the hardest for me. It says, then Jesus commanded him and them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. When Jesus would do these first-class miracles, he heals the man covered with leprosy. And he said, don't say anything. Just go show the priest or he heals the blind man. No, don't, don't tell everybody. And, and it's not that Jesus was being modest about his power. He just knew that the more they advertised these incredible miracles, the more determined they would be to kill him and to stop his work. Of course, one of his greatest miracles is resurrecting Lazarus, and that made them so angry they killed him within a few weeks. So he said... Don't, don't advertise this, but the more he told them that, the more they told everybody. Now catch this, friends. We're kind of talking a little bit about mission work today. Jesus was a missionary. Here is a man who has received an incredible miracle from God of knowledge, of healing, of speech. And after he gets it, Jesus says, don't tell anybody. How hard would that be for you? You get the gift of gab and you can't talk. <laughs> that would be really tough. But think about this for a minute. Jesus told that man, don't say anything, and he told everybody. He tells us to tell everybody and we don't say anything. Let that sink in for a minute. We can speak and talk about God. Now, you know, one time Jesus healed a demoniac and he told him, 
and this was in Decapolis also, he said, go and tell the great things that God has done for you. So sometimes Jesus knew you can tell these people it's not going to be a problem. If they start going and telling the people in Judea where his enemies were, that would be a problem. He told the demoniac, he said, go tell what great things God has done for you. But he told this group, he knew enemies were spying, he said, don't say anything. And they told everybody about what had happened. Now, the most important thing that we want to mention today is that God wants to open our ears. This miracle has a great spiritual significance. He wants us to hear his voice. Can you imagine the first thing this man heard was the voice of Jesus saying, be open, and then giving them a command. And to suddenly be able to understand and to be able to talk. They must have heard him say something because they said they heard him speaking plainly. Perfect articulation and enunciation and uh, the Lord wants to give us that ability. God told Moses, I want you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, this is Exodus 4, verse 10, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant. Now, he's not saying he wasn't eloquent. Moses wrote some of the most eloquent things in history. He had not spoken Egyptian in 40 years, and now God wants him to go talk to the Pharaoh who spoke perfect Egyptian in the palace. And he said, I, I can't do that. And God said, the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, the blind? Have not I, the Lord, made him? What the Lord did for that man today was a wonderful miracle, but what is a bigger miracle? When God opens our ears, gives us the Holy Spirit and the courage to speak for him, we're not forbidden. You know, he told the disciples, do not go anywhere until you get the Holy Spirit. But then when the Holy Spirit came, he said, I want you to go everywhere. Has the Lord retracted the Holy Spirit or does he want us to go everywhere? He wants us to tell everybody. And when the people saw this miracle, I mean, Jesus did a lot of miracles. It talks about Matthew 15 during the same time. Matthew says, so the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking and the maimed made whole, the lame walking and the blind seeing. So there was a whole cadre of miracles he performed on this occasion, but this one was so unique that it says the people said they were astonished beyond measure. You know, in preparing for this message, I, I did a little research and I saw a video online that it just, it actually brought me to tears of a, a young lady who was 29 years old who had never heard before. She had learned to talk with a speech therapist and, and uh, she was actually married. But you know, they've developed this surgery now where these cochlear implants that a lot of people, depends on your circumstances, they can restore some form of speech. And I just wanted to show you this little video. It's only about a minute of this girl experiencing hearing for the first time. <laughs> it's like so close. There you go. We're not right over it. They're adjusting the position of the frequencies. There you go. It's beeping. So now technically your device is on. Can you tell? <laughs> down for a second. Just get used to the sound. <laughs> what does it sound like? Do you want to hear myself cry? <laughs> he said, I don't want to hear myself cry. <laughs> Can you hear me? And you hear your voice? Does your voice sound pretty loud? Um, no, not really. Well, that's good. <laughs> My <laughs> laughter sounds loud. Yeah, you'll get used to all of that over time. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Do you want to hear your husband say something? Now, what you just saw here, can you imagine she's using you know, a little bit of a clumsy device <laughs> for a person to hear for the first time or to see for the first time? Imagine what happened to a town when Jesus went through. The emotion... And you can see why people loved him and, and uh, why he changed the world. What he did for 
these people when he healed them and opened their eyes, he wants us to have that same kind of enthusiasm and joy. Now, if you told this girl not to tell anybody that she'd had her hearing healed, would that be hard to do? If you've been saved from sin, can you keep that news from anybody? No, you just, you're going to want to tell everybody about what God has done for you. Amen? The good news, you can't keep it to yourself. Well, the Lord's told us to be missionaries, to go and tell, and he's given us that gift of speech and hearing so we can hear his voice and then share his word. How many of you want to say, Lord, I want to go? I want to tell. I want to be your missionary. We're going to sing about this. I will sing of my Redeemer. Invite the song leaders to come out. Invite you to stand. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. Which verses? 1 and 2. And um, that's 3, 4, 3 in your hymnals. Father, we're so thankful for the news that Jesus heals, that he saves, he can open our ears and open our mouths, and I pray that we will not hesitate to go forth and to proclaim your praises and to talk about your goodness and the way of salvation. Thank you for blessing and protecting all the people that went overseas and, and uh, did this mission work and keeping everyone safe, and I pray that you'll bless the ongoing work we do from day to day as we go from this place. Help us to be your witnesses. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi friends, the program you just watched was recorded at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where I serve as lead pastor. We'd love to meet you. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, come and worship the Lord with us. We'll meet you in the lobby and shake your hand.